But if she isn't, I would suggest you stop at a grocery store and pick up three roses or whatever kind of flowers she likes. And when you take it home to her, as you go home and you tell her, this is a symbol of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who wants me to love you as I've never loved you before. And this is going to make a big, strong fellowship. It's going to make a growing fellowship. But it's going to change the world. We do not have families like we need to have. But God says, this fellowship will live it out and walk it through. Many of you realize the fellowship has been through some very difficult times. In the winter of 1993, uh, one of my directors, a man that had brought me up in the fellowship, had decided to leave. My other mentor had left two years before. All of the strife that was beginning to develop in the international. And I'm thinking, maybe I ought to get out of the fellowship too. And I began seeking God, and I wasn't getting an answer. And one morning I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning and began to pray, <coughs> just pray in the Spirit. I'm trying to get the mind of God. I'm breathed in my spirit about what's happening. I just saw my two best friends, mentors, uh, men that I respected leaving. I'm praying. Time to go to work in the morning. Time to go to my office. I told Barbara, call the office. I'm not going in. I'm going to hear from God this morning. Continue to pray in the spirit. And uh, I heard the word Haggai. I continued to I just thought, you know, that's nothing. I kept praying in the spirit. I must have heard Haggai two or three times. Finally, I got my Bible out, and I began to book, read the book of Haggai. I hadn't spent an awful lot of time in Haggai. <laughs> but Haggai, in the setting of Haggai, is the Jewish people are coming back from their... 70 years of exile. And uh, there's a man named Zerubbabel. He's a businessman that God sent to lead the group. And there was a prophet named Haggai. And they came back to rebuild the temple. They began to rebuild the temple. They built the foundation. They built the altar. And uh, strife broke out among the people who were in Jerusalem when they came back. And the work came to a stop. They began to build their own houses. And uh, God came to them and said uh, to them, uh, you look for much, and indeed you have little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins. And every one of you runs to his own house, his own fine family house. And then in the second chapter, he speaks to Haggai. And Haggai says, in the seventh month of the 21st day of the month, I want you to remember that. The Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest of the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how did you see it now in comparison? Is it not in your eyes of nothing? When you look at this fellowship, when I looked at what was happening, when I looked at the people falling away, we went from 1,800 chapters in America down to less than the, eventually to about 100.
Who is among you now that saw the old fellowship in its glory? Many of you did. You saw the Spirit of God moving in great power. But now it's in our eyes, there's nothing. And that's where we were back a few years ago. And then God said to the prophet Hekai, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. Say to the Lord, be strong. It says the Lord, be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. Be strong, all you people of the fellowship, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. And it goes on. And I will shake the nations once again. And come, and they will come to the desire of the nations, and I will fill this temple with my glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine. And the glory of this latter temple will be greater than the former. And God spoke that into my heart. And I got up off that floor that day. And I went back to the fellowship. And when the changes started to take place, new leaders, Demas died. I said, uh, God is going to rebuild this fellowship. And I thought it would happen then. I thought those leaders were the ones that would take us into the future. And do a great, mighty rebuilding of this fellowship. But it didn't happen. And uh, you know you're in this difficulty and you don't know what to do and uh, you're trying to believe God. <coughs> and a man from Southern Oregon, a man named Ivan Sisk, a prophetic man, heard that I'd been thrown out of the fellowship. He called me and he said, Bob, three months ago God gave me a vision of this fellowship. Let me tell you, read the vision. On this 22nd day, on September 22nd, 2001, the Lord gave me the following vision of the full gospel of business and fellowship international. I saw the old fellowship in the form of a temple. Whoa. That got my eyes, ears, and eyes both. I saw the old fellowship in the form of a temple which had been leveled to the ground, to the basic foundation upon which this fellowship had been conceived. The vision which God gave to our founder, Demas Shikari, was all that remained. And then I saw a new stone being brought into the constructed temple. These new stones looked like they were 18 by 24 inches square and about 48 inches long. They were perfect with no flaws. These stones represented new men that God was preparing out in the quarry. So that when the temple was being rebuilt, there would not be heard the sound of iron or hammer, even as it was in the temple of Solomon was being rebuilt, was being built. And these men were mighty men of integrity and honesty. They were men of the word. They moved in the power of the Holy Ghost. No more works of the flesh. And the Lord also said to me that there would be a change in the top levels of leadership. And there would come unity, no more strife, no more envy over who gets the credit. And these men would have a proven record out in the quarry. Men who have a proven track record of being led by the Spirit. There was a new spirit in the fellowship in America. There is a new spirit in the fellowship in America as we move to the goal that God has given us in the beginning. And I was up, another young Joshua generation man, that was in 2002, a lot of, 
water passed under the bridge, a lot of difficulties came to Barbara and I, a lot of, uh, and God would hold us steady through a prophetic word or, or from time to time. But then in 2006, on the 21st day of the seventh month, I want you to get that. Peter was woken up, woken by the Lord by the Holy Spirit and told to go and incorporate the fellowship. That's the day he was woken up. We didn't realize it until we were in a board meeting recently and I read this to the men and Peter said, that was the day the Lord woke me. This fellowship is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit just moving through it. And these new men, these new Joshua's. I was in Boston. I've been thrown out of the fellowship seven, a few years after that. I've had a, a really spotty record in the full gospel business in the international. Barbara and I decided to go to the Boston Convention. They were about the only place in the country that would have us at that time. And we were setting out listening to what's going on. The, uh, uh, I think it was maybe one of the first times I've heard a, a Joshua Generation man speak, and that man named James Levesque. And James Levesque, uh, they're growing up in the tenements, had no idea of what Christianity was. And uh, someone uh, brought him to a church he heard a couple sermons, been there three weeks, he went up to the pastor and he said, well, he's gonna start doing the stuff. <laughs> and the uh, pastor said, what stuff? He said, well, the stuff that Jesus talks about in the Bible. <laughs> Casting out the devils, you know, uh, <laughs> praying for the sick. <laughs> And uh, he was uh, eventually asked to leave that church. <laughs> but James Event was speaking that morning. And when he got through, he came over to where Barbara and I were. and began to prophesy over us. And he said, God has raised you up because you have the, fort the, uh, uh, the uh, fortitude <coughs> to handle a generation like us. And he began to prophesy about the Joshua generation. And this is when I first started to see what God was going to have us be do. And uh, we started the Joshua generation chapter uh, in Seattle. I was in a meeting of our first Joshua chapter in Seattle. Young man, Joshua Alvarez was his name. At that time he was uh, 17 years old. He's speaking and uh, when he got through speaking he says uh, anybody in here that was healed while I was speaking? Some hands went up first guy asked said, what, uh, uh, what happened to you? He said, I was standing between two trucks. He's a truck driver. And he said, the other, I wasn't watching the truck backed into me, crushed me, my vertebrae. He said, I came in here with a pain level of nine, and I'm leaving with a pain level of minus two. <laughs> And Joshua turned around to Barbara and I, sitting, we were sitting near the back, and uh, he said, uh, I've given you the keys of David. And he said, the latter house reign, the latter house shall be greater than the former. And God told me to tell you that when I walked in here tonight, 17 years old. Three months later at our 
Portland Convention. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was maybe the third convention that we had of this organization. That same young man was starting to minister to the group as a whole. He was down in front. I was at the head table. Peter was at the head table. And he said, uh, I see four angels in the corners of this room. I was in a meeting two months ago and I saw those four, same four angels. And he began to speak and all at once he turned around at the head table. One his head at the head at the head table and said, this organization will be the catalyst for the greatest move of God to ever hit this nation. 17 years old. God is going to use this fellowship to rekindle the spirit of God and move of the spirit and this fellowship is going to move across this nation and going to bring the glory of God back to the businessmen of this world. morning we have one of those Joshua generation men with us. Joshua generation men are something, uh, I call them born since 1960. Those men. This young man, his father was a full gospel businessman. His grandfather was a full gospel businessman. And God has raised up him a prophet, a prophet of the nations. Jamie, come up here and uh, Well, again, it's such an honor. Uh, last night was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been such an honor to to be a part of what God's doing with full gospel businessmen right now and, uh, in America, and um, you know, it's really this fellowship is really being with the family. And uh, so I was actually so surprised. I didn't know that so many of the national directors were going to be here. So I came. I thought we were just going to have a, a good conference with the local area guys, and it just felt I was so excited um, with joy when so many of the national directors were here because you guys feel like family, and uh, we feel that way because our hearts are connected. Uh, in this hour for what God's getting ready to do. And uh, isn't it, is, do you guys feel that way when you get together as a family? And uh, the um, really started the national convention, and it's kind of funny to watch clips. Was that really that intense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I was watching, I was like, wow, I, I was kind of intense. I feel like I need to apologize. I'm sorry, I was so intense. <laughs> Um, if you guys have your Bibles, why don't you go with me to Romans chapter 4. Um, I just wanted to share something, and, and uh, I don't know how much time we have this morning, but I just want to share something with you real quick. I, I want to share a dream, a uh, prophetic word that I had. Uh, I shared it at the National Convention, I want to share it again. And uh, in response to uh, what Paul was just saying concerning the prophetic words concerning uh, this house and what God's getting ready to do. And uh, I had this dream one night. And uh, has, did anybody ever see that movie called Inception? Did anyone see that? It was, it was a movie about dreams where people go into dreams and have dreams within dreams. And dreams within dreams and the whole reality. It was like one of those brain, mind-blowing movies where you're at the end you're like, what just happened? Anyways, I had that happen once. And I had one night where I had a dream from the Lord. And it began a whole series of dreams in one night where I went dream. And then in the dream, I had a dream. And in the dream, I had a dream. And uh, so if you're going to have to stay with me for a second, because if you don't stick with me, I'm going to lose you on this. What happened is one night, I have a dream from the Lord. And in the dream, I, I come walking up to a bench that's facing the ocean. There's a man by the name of Bill Johnson who's sitting on this bench, and he's staring at the coastline. Now, Bill Johnson is a pastor of a church 
in Redding, California, where they're literally changing a city and training and equipping people all over the nations of the world to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast that demon. They're literally sending teams to other countries and, and emptying hospitals out of everyone getting healed in the hospital. I mean, they're just changing the world. It still means a lot to me. And, uh, and he's been very influential in my life. And so in this dream, I walk up and here's Bill sitting on a bench. And he's staring off at the ocean. And I, I sat down next to him and I said, Bill, what, what, are you, what are you staring at? What are you, what are you looking for? And he said, Jamie, there once was a man who sat here and waited for a wave of revival to come and hit America. And I am sitting here waiting for the next wave of revival. And then he turned his eyes to the ocean line and he just waited intensely. And I, I wake up from the dream and, uh, and, and I'm just shaking because you can feel the presence of God. That there's a wave of revival getting ready to hit America. And it was going to look and, and, and but be greater than even the waves of revival that have hit this nation before. And I wake up from this dream. Now, has anybody ever woken up for a dream at 2 or 3 in the morning and you weren't really sure what was reality? And then where you were, and I mean, I, I woke up this morning just with like the weirdest dreams. I was just like, I thought I needed to like pack up a refrigerator and take it home. And I was like, what was I thinking about? You know, I wake up in the middle of the night and I didn't know what to do, but I knew that I had a prophetic word from the Lord and that I needed to go tell Bill Johnson this prophetic word. So I thought, I'm going to go tell Bill the word, so I'm going to go back to sleep to go tell him. So. <laughs> I fall back to sleep. When I fall back to sleep, I, 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 wait, I, I end up immediately in a dream. I'm standing in front of Bill, and I'm telling Bill the dream that I just had. And as I'm telling him the dream I had, I go back into it, and I'm seeing the dream as I'm telling it to him. You guys okay? So here I am telling him the dream as I'm telling him the dream. But in the dream, my phone rings. And I answer the phone, and it's my mom. Now, in my dreams, I told you last night, she's a praying mom. She's always either convicted me, or in, in, through my life, or she has uh, taught me how to hear the voice of the Lord. She's the first one taught me how to prophesy, how to interpret dreams. Uh, she's the one taught me how to journal, how to hear the voice of the Lord. So in my dreams, my mom represents the Holy Spirit. So uh, in the dream, my phone rings, and it's my mom. And I answer the phone, I'm standing with Bill Johnson, I've just been telling the dream I just had. And she goes, Jamie, I had a dream last night. And then all of a sudden... I end up having her dream inside the dream I was already having as I was telling Bill the dream I just had. <laughs> Are you still okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, if you're lost, your spirit will get it. Um, so anyways, I'm, now I'm having my mom's dream in my dream, and, and she's saying, she, she's beginning to tell me the dream, and in the dream, I'm walking up to a bench that's facing the ocean, and Bill Johnson is sitting there. She says, in the dream, I came to Bill and I said, Bill, what are you staring at? What are you waiting for? And he said, Jamie, there once was a man who sat here and waited for a wave of revival to come to hit America. And I'm waiting for the next one. And she, in the dream, she had the exact same dream that I had. But she says, but there is one thing different about my dream than your dream. She said that as Bill was sitting there, he was wearing a baseball cap. And he said, you know, that man wore this baseball cap. In dreams, usually baseball caps or any sort of um, hat would represent authority. He says, that man who sat here and waited for a wave of revival, he wore this hat and he saw that wave of revival come. He takes the hat off his head and he looks at it and he puts it on my head and kind of shifts it onto my head. And he says, it's your turn to wait and watch for revival. And in the dream, I sat down next to him, put his arm around me, and we just waited and we watched, and we stared at this coastline waiting. And I remember in the dream, the moment I sat with him, and I wore this hat waiting for revival, I saw the, the waves beginning to move back, and all of a sudden begin to form and come up. And I woke up from the dream as the crest of the wave was touching my face. And, uh, you know, going back to what I was bringing into you last night, I, when I was sharing about the Mal, uh, Malachi chapter 4, the spirit of Elijah. And it was the spirit of Elijah who would come. It would prepare the way for a generation to receive the second coming of the Lord Jesus. But it says in Malachi chapter 4, it says that in the hearts of the fathers will be turned to the children. And the hearts of the children will be turned to the fathers. 
And it's not just one generation laying hold of another generation, but it's the two generations embracing each other for a current move of God in the earth. And when you look throughout revival history, you'll see that the past revivals and moves of God in the earth, that when a movement that came on the earth was coming to an end, and a new movement was beginning with another generation, it was often the older or the, the first movement that would usually point to the next movement and say, listen, that's not the real thing. What we have is still moving. But I feel like what's happening here in this day is as mothers and fathers and with sons and daughters who are experiencing past moves in a new move, as we embrace each other in what God is doing in this day and this hour, we're going to create a momentum that's unprecedented for a wave of revival to touch the earth. And I believe that this dream represented not just recognizing one generation, but seeing tri-generational, what God's done in the past. Those who are still walking the earth and experience God in a new generation coming and embracing each other, waiting for God to come. Now, I I wanted to, uh, if you have your Bibles, if you guys turn to Romans chapter 4. I wanted to bring this up because uh, we, many of us have heard the prophetic words of God, what God's going to do. And we've heard what God's going to do in the fellowship. And we've heard what he was going to do and what, what uh, even uh, Demos had seen for the, the fellowship and things that have yet to even come to pass. And we know that we're waiting with anticipation. But I, I, I want to I share with you real quickly uh, the power of hope in the prophetic. Here the, here's the thing. In Isaiah 55 it says, My word will not re- uh, return to me void but will accomplish everything for which I sent for it to accomplish. And there's a, there's a guy by the name of Bob Jones, he said this, he says, the casual response to a prophetic word produces casualties. See, when God says something, and he gives a prophetic word into your life, it demands a response from us to respond with hope and with faith, to lay a hold of the promise, and to bring it into the season of now, and demand for its fulfillment where we are right now. And there was prophetic words, even those 40, 50, 60 year old prophetic words that you were waiting to come to pass. There is a demand in, in, uh, that when God says a word, that we respond to the word and we pull the word into now and we, and we partner with God for what he wants to do. It says that when I send a word, it will not return to me void. What does that mean? That means that when God sends a word, The word needs to go back to him. You see, when God says, I'm going to do something in a fellowship, I'm going to do something in America, there there is this God is looking for an agreement with those on the earth to say, yes, God, we we desire and we ask, would you do what you said you would do? And God says, I send a word. And when people take the word I, I have and send it back to me, it will not return to me void but will accomplish everything for which I sent it to accomplish. Amen. I agree. And this is significant and important that, because that means the, the role of the prophetic word is meant to infuse intercession and prayer. That God, we oftentimes say, well, God's going to do it. Let's just kick back and wait for it. And God said, no, no, no. I am looking for agreement in the earth. Who will believe it? But here's the thing. How many guys know that we're in the middle of a war? Yeah. Now, you know, I don't get too caught up in it. I'm not too concerned about getting beat up by the devil. I have more power in my pinky than all the antichrists of hell. Amen. 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 I mean, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is more power than any blood shed on the earth. It speaks a better word. I'm not a defeatist mentality. I'm not worried. I'm not scared. I'm not intimidated. But we are in a battle. As a pastor... I sit and I, 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 I mentor and I work with marriages falling apart, young men and women addicted to um, substances and um, you know pornography, and I, I'm working with people who are who are um, going bankrupt, losing their homes, and I see the battle that is waging over the hearts of the church to release hopelessness because if we can, if the enemy can place hopelessness inside the church. He will cripple the church from believing that God is able to do what he said he would do. And so I want to read this to you because this is profound what I'm about to read to you. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. 
It says, against all hope, <coughs> Abraham hoped. Against all hope, Abraham hoped, and in so doing, he became the father of many nations. See, what happened is, is that when God gave a word, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. And then, in the midst of barrenness, in the midst of hopelessness, Abraham chose to have hope in his heart. Amen. And when he chose to have hope in his heart, he became refined and ready and purified to become the prophetic word that God released over his life. See, sometimes the Lord will allow us, like in Haggai, to Israel, to go through strife and difficulty. He doesn't create the difficulty, but he allows us to walk through the difficulty in order that the, that hopelessness would refine us like fire so that we would create virtue to be stewards of the prophetic word when it comes to pass in our life. Amen. Are you, are you getting that? Yeah. So what happens is, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that as uh, if, we're, if we uh, don't go through chastening, then we are like bastard children without a father. But because we're children, God will chasten us so that it would refine us in the virtue uh, that, we, that we would become partakers of His holiness. How many of us know what got you here won't get you there? Amen. How many of you guys know that... that uh, and the, and the prophetic word has to come to pass It's because you do not have the virtues necessary to steward the breakthrough when it comes I'm telling you, there's a wave of revival coming to America But God in his infathomable, uh, outrageous wisdom Will not give a revival to a people Who will not be able to steward the fruit of the harvest Alright right. So what God is doing in the midst of difficulty and silence, as he's creating a bride that looks like him. And through the midst of difficulty and strife, God is creating a people that know how to have hope against all hope. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I want to just continue on. It says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't even consider it. Praise the Lord. Come on. He didn't even consider that he was old and his wife's womb was barren. God said he would do what he would do. And I'm not even taking into consideration all the things working against me. Amen. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform. How many of you guys know if God has said it, it doesn't matter what's working against it, but how many of you guys know, and we know in the past, in the people, we know from our own lives, we hear the testimonies, and we all know that God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Every one of us would say as we stand at the podium to give our testimony, that we would say, I don't deserve to stand here, but God in His wisdom has done a mighty work in my life and made me a, a voice to a people. And God is, 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 is working something in this fellowship. God is working something in the leadership of this fellowship. God has been working something in this fellowship through the difficulty that we walk through. And God will do what He said He would do if a people have hope. You know, and it's very interesting when you look at the concept of hope. America has taught us that there's a tone of hope. And the word hope is this blind, ethereal, you know, like maybe it will happen, maybe it won't. We just got to have hope. If you look at Webster's Dictionary, the definition for hope is the, the desire for something good to happen without any expectation for fulfillment. That's what Webster's Dictionary says. With, with, no, with no reason to believe that's going to happen, but still trying to have hope. The defin you know how they, they'll say in Webster's Dictionary, they'll use a little sentence to explain a word? The sentence in Webster's Dictionary for hopes is this. Uh, that that uh, we don't know if they survived the car crash, 
we can only hope. You see, the world's concept of hope is like the lottery. We don't know if it's going to happen. But here's the thing. When we read the scriptures, we hear a different tone for hope. And when you look at the Hebrew definition for hope, it says hope, the happy anticipation of good. The happy anticipation of good. The happiest people on the earth are people who have hope. And then it says this in Romans chapter 5. It says, now in 5 verse 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Hope will never disappoint. When God said He would do something, we can stand in agreement that God will do what He said He would do, because He said it. Do you remember when all of Israel was looking at Goliath and they were intimidated and they were afraid because the circumstances were bigger than their ability to overcome it? But it took a little David coming along to say, well, I'm not really so sure about his size and his war ability, but God said that he would stand with Israel, so send me at it. I'll take him down. Do you remember it was... It was uh, the 12 tribes, the leaders of the 12 tribes that were sent out to spy out the land. And Moses sent the leaders of the 12 tribes out. And they saw all the fruits of the promised land. And they came back to Moses and they said, hey, man, that fruit looks good. It's big. Land flowing with milk and honey. But there's, there's one problem. There's giants in the land. The walls are big. We're old. We can't fight them. There's no way that we can go in there to take the land. But then there was this guy named Joshua and Caleb. And they stood and they said, no, 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 no. I saw everything that they saw. And I didn't even need to go over there to believe that no matter what we put our hands to, God's going to bless it. Because he said that he would give us the, the, the promised land. So what happened? Moses and the, and the leadership, they believed the report of the ten, not the report of the two. And they ripped their clothes. And it literally took a whole generation that didn't believe to die off in order for those who had hope to cross into the promised land. Believe me, I, I believe I'm standing with a fellowship that is believing to have hope against all hope in America. I believe I'm standing with leadership. I'm standing among people who have hope against all hope for a fellowship for the church and for a nation. Amen. And I, I, I believe that God this morning wants to put a, a, a resurgence of hope in our hearts that even when we leave this place, that we're going to carry such a message of bold hope and expectation that we literally make people uncomfortable yeah. with how much we are believing in the face of our circumstances. I think this morning God wants to release hope to your heart. And not like a worldly hope, well, we'll see what the Lord does. But no, 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 no. No, no, no. Like a bold, radical, wild hope that would literally thrust yourself in the midst of impossibility because you worship a God of, of impossibility. Amen. The God of impossibility cannot do impossible things unless he's put in impossible circumstances. Amen. We will not see God do what He said He would do unless we get out of the boat and step out in the water when God beckons us to do something outrageous against all natural circumstances. Amen. I, I believe with all my heart that there, I still believe, as wild and crazy as my generation is, I still believe that you are the plumb line of faith, that you are the plumb line of hope. That you are the plumb line of faithfulness, standing before the Lord against all odds. Listen, I watch kids heal the sick, cast out demons, and as soon as things get difficult, they're running from the Lord. But there's a generation that I'm standing in the midst of, in the presence of right now, that is the plumb line of hope for a nation that will choose to believe against all odds. And so I want to pray for you this morning, and then we're going to take a break, but. I, I want to pray for you this morning that God, if, if there has been you know, this hope deferred, has made the heart sick. But a promise fulfilled is a tree of life. 
I, I want to pray this morning that there would be such hope in your heart that you would have the ability to dream again. I just feel like that even against uh, standing in the face of hopelessness, uh, literally there's been moments where the enemy has been robbing your ability to dream with God. Robbing your ability to set plans in motion, to dream and think bigger outside of the box. And I feel like God wants to give you a license to dream again by releasing a resurgence of hope in your heart. Is that okay? Yeah. Why don't you stand with me? Well, let's do this. You know, I laid hands on everyone last night, but what if we, I don't know if this is conventional or not, but uh, what if we just got into groups of three or four and just began to pray for each other that God would reignite hope in our hearts? What if we just broke down into groups, lay hands on each other, and just began to pray for hope? Let me just pray for you, then we'll break down into groups and start praying. God, maybe you can just come pray. The Lord Jesus, we just, Father, we just stand, God, in, in, the, in the presence of, of the remembrance of the promises that you've made over this fellowship. God, we stand in the in the presence of, uh, of promises of yet to be fulfilled. God, we stand with this faithful, uh, this, this faithful generation. God, who's faithfully stood before you. And God, this, this morning, God, I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and release hope to every heart. God, I pray, Lord, that you would make us prophets of hope. God, that you would make us prisoners of hope. That our heart would be locked, unable to move from hope. God, that we would be unable, God, we would be unable to be hopeless. God, that we would be unable to move away from the promises that you say. God, that we would stand in agreement with every word that you've made over our cities over our chapters, over the national organization of, of full gospel, God, that we would stand in belief that you are able to do what you said that you, were, you would do. God, we declare that 2014 is a year of fulfillment. God, we declare, God, that the, the wave of revival that you said would come at the building of the temple, this building of this fellowship, God, would touch earth in 2014. I prophesy over your chapters that this year you are going to experience a fresh breath from heaven upon your gatherings. As you gather and pray, the Holy Spirit Himself will be present and come down and begin to change and transform lives.